the Within Orb podcast. Come get Within Orb. Hello, my name is Jen Zart, and welcome to Within Orb, a production of the Celestial Arts Education Library, a podcast bringing people together around the love of astrology, books. Join me as I interview people about the astrology books that change their life and practice. You can support the podcast at withinorb.com. Welcome to another episode of Within Orb, and today we are flying all the way across the top of the U.S. to land in Maine and meet Amy Green. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jen. Yeah, so it's awesome to have you here. And one thing about your work I love is interdisciplinary combinations. So if you wanted to maybe like introduce your vantage point to the world, I'd love to hear how you see that from this moment. I mean, I'm a consulting astrologer, so I work with people one-on-one, but I also hold a lot of group space. And that came from working with people one-on-one and realizing I needed to keep working with them. Astrology is so much about time magic and living it and seeing it change and seeing the processes in us that might have started with one interpretation of a piece of our birth chart that evolves over time to become something that is a strength and a known puzzle we've solved and can help others with. And so um, sticking with people and doing client support over time. And that comes from having been an advocate. So I worked in the world of the most extreme harms. I was thinking about who do I work with, you know, and it's like, I work with survivors of sex abuse and people who want to learn high quality astrology, but might struggle with certain learning disabilities or just have a brain that won't want to pick up on things in the same way or write from the books and parents. So parents are living a world that wow, their heart's walking around outside of their bodies in another human all the time. Like, how extreme is that, right? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah, and even um, I do synastry work with, like, kinksters. So we're talking about extremes of experience for a lot of people where if you bring that to an astrological setting, it might be too much. And so I'm finding myself working with the people who it's not too much for me. And so because of all the pre-astrology work in trauma support and crisis intervention and court support and the world of transformative justice and what happens when people who are harmed harm and they're still important to take care of. I am a really deep astrology nerd (laughs) as far as being like the books that we're going to talk about today are the classics. There are classics in there. So coming to it, though, from the world of care and advocacy and support models and trying to keep up to date on those, a lot of the books I draw from are outside of astrology. Well, that's an important practice to hold because as much as astrology books are important and they're very important ones, I love that you do reach into other domains of care, as you say, and human experience to know that, you know, everything that we can do to be as fully present in our own work as astrologers is important. And we can't just pretend as though there's no outside world and there's only astrology books. But you can do that here (laughs) for a moment. (laughs) Sounds like heaven. (laughs) Yeah, right. right? Of the vault of heaven. Yeah. So for a little moment inside Kaylee, it's like only astrology books. But I do love that, you know, even some of our most vaulted astrologers have references to other domains of human experience. And that makes them as textured and rich in their astrology. So That's amazing. What was your first introduction to astrology in book or text format? Well, in keeping with the interdisciplinary thing, it was actually Culpepper's Herbal. Hey! That was when I was very young, though my mother is an herbalist. I have not followed in her footsteps in that way, but I was curious that there were certain plants that had the nature of Jupiter. I was like, what's that? What's that about? (laughs) And then when I got hooked through really Astro Deanst as a website, the first book that I went out and got was Horoscope Symbols by Robert Hand. And 
started trying to make sense of everything through that. So it's definitely formative and still on my shelf. Was it a self-study then? Yeah. There was a neat overlap in college. I studied ancient Greek and my professor at the time, this was in the early, early 2000s, Sam Siegel at Sarah Lawrence had heard of Project Hindsight. Oh, wow. So was telling his Greek students that there's so much we don't know. For example, I know about these astrologers that are interested in texts that haven't been translated. So thinking back to that, I didn't take that bait. I didn't go with it at that point, but it was out there. Do you still have Greek in your brain or did it atrophy somewhat with age? Not to the extent I wish I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just at a etymology level, I think. Mm-hmm. It's a good lineage, though, to have in your mind to be able to draw from, given the current fascination with these translations that's ongoing. Yeah, and does solidly ground me in the Hellenistic techniques. Yeah. You know, I start there. Very, very fun. So, yeah, it seems um, Hand was involved with Project Hindsight at the beginning and then he and Zoller dropped off and it was just Schmidt after that but it's funny that you also had a professor sort of saying you can go through door number one and you're like I'll take door number two (laughs) a little bit later over here yeah are there any notable things you remember from horoscope symbols that stick with you honestly it's some of the writing like that you can just use your own words describe what you're learning through your practice with people keep it in, I mean, some of the paragraphs are like bullets, bullet notes, you know, and and that it's still so, so useful. So not to be held back by whatever, and I'm this is not by any means a critique of Han's scholarship, like incredible scholar, but not to be held back by whatever your style is and how approachable your writing is or is not. You know? Awesome. All right. So the question of the hour, you're already on the edge of the continent so to speak, you know, the edge of the country up there in the north in Maine. So maybe we'll go to Greenland and you get to take a trip all by yourself, small little satchel. What three astrology books would you be taking with you? I get an ephemeris, right? Yeah, everybody gets the ephemeris. That's just standard. If you don't know what that is, you've got to get one because it's basically everybody's birthday in one book. I wish I could take an ephemeris from multiple centuries back. Oh, yeah? The, The historical arcs are very important to me. I almost said I would take Cosmos and Psyche, but I've been finding so much now that is even even beyond that. Mm. So Firmicus is my my number one man. He's one that has to be in there from the thesis. That's probably my go-to text. What do you love about Firmicus's thesis? Primarily, I love that he was writing in the fall of the Roman Empire. You know, the whole thing is actually a letter to Mavordius. And there is a way that it builds so that if you don't listen to what he told you at the beginning, you might think he's describing only extremes. So it can be a hard text to just open and say, oh, (laughs) I will be beheaded after I have had a short time of nobility. Oh, what does that mean? (laughs) You know, (laughs) that's one of the ones in there. But to know that it's building on what comes before, it's it's a teaching text. And the way in which his explicit descriptions of what can only be how to have the worst dirt on the competitors that the noble class is concerned with, all of these details about people's terrible debauchery and awful predilections and all these things. But when we read through it and you think of it in a less judgmental way, boy, it's a lot of interesting data on how to find things that work for people, what their shapes that they're holding, things that feel taboo, things that feel like they're hidden from connection with others. The more I sit with what seems like just seedy stuff in Firmicus (laughs) and pull it into my Sinistry work with couples. It's just yielding so much connection between people and and to be able to translate it into words that you can hear that don't come loaded pre full of judgment. 
that's hard work. I'm still working on how to take so many of the things and shapes and make them palatable. Well, and I hear you also describing that this text is one to have a relationship with because you can't just enter it and extract something and then utilize that because that's not really the the way it's teaching you. You have to actually go through it as a lesson and as a curriculum and extractive reading isn't going to be very helpful and might even turn somebody off from understanding what's even happening there. Yeah, that's true. I think there are ways to offer sections of it to students that with the right framing, you can take super useful lessons in in one sitting, but in general, yeah. And which is hard because there are so many little sections missing. Do you think we'll find them one day? I don't know. I'm beginning to get interested in whether or not we can find more of the Babylonian astrology, like <laughs> cuneiform. Yeah. Those long cycles are are really intriguing. Yeah. What intrigues you about the longer cycles? Well, we've been looking a lot at the great conjunctions. And currently, my partner, Alex Mon, and I do this group storylines, threads, and cycles that we've had ongoing, where we are placing currently the Saturn-Neptune conjunction in amongst all of the great conjunctions, and then we're doing a lot of eclipse work. So how does that weave into it and pulling these shapes that are really only visible when you do these long stretches of time? And it's more than zodiacal. I've been hosting groups that follow the phase cycles with Venus, too. Yeah. And realizing really through trying to understand phase, right? Like we come at things just like, how does that actually work? What does that actually mean in a chart that Venus has her retrograde and then doesn't reach visible evening status until she's in the place that she retrograded a year ago? Like it's so neat that you have to do that underworld journey and then that's the place she has competence. That's the place that that happens in Venus cycles. So the like the work of Nick Dagan best with phases and intervals, I'm I'm trying to make inspiration from that work across these longer timeframes too. So that is Babylonian. That's pre-Zodiacal, but it's a great layer of testimony to what we read through the way that we read charts now. Yeah. Have you worked at all with Robert Blaschke's work on phases? I have not. That might be another next best place to go. Yeah. Imagine stepping into a room of 5,000 astrology books, turning a corner and stepping into a room of 2,000 more. The Celestial Arts Education Library is every astrologer's dream, and it can be yours. I invite you to come support Kaylee before you can visit physically. Your support will mean the creation of 52 new episodes of Within Orb next year, four issues of The Kaylee Review, our inaugural journal, and countless book talks, events, classes for our community. Visit our website, www.kaylee.institute slash support, to select your level of care. Please help support Kaylee into the future, our future, so that we may study the future together. Thank you for listening. Please enjoy the rest of the show. All right. So Firmicus leads the pack. Who's next? Dorotheus is a text that I do go back to a lot. When we began talking about how astrology really is time magic, electional astrology, and being able to interpret the moment in all of these ways that we have such clear guidance and guidelines from Dorotheus the clarity is really helpful. So always trying to stay out of the weeds and go back to the text is a great grounding to have. So I would want I would want to have that access. So when you're looking at Dorotheus for electional, what are some of your favorite go-to factors to consider? You know, asking a favor yeah. is a great thing to do with a, with a clean election. So there are conditions for the moon that Dorotheus lists, which are true and good in any election, but particularly when you're looking for for a favor, which is us exposing our vulnerabilities with the moon. So checking in with that. 
part of what I added this to the list for is not having it all in my mind all the time. I need to sit longer with it, but I would like it for occupying me <laughs> if I'm going to be stuck on that island. Yeah. 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 I and mean, there's a lot of moving parts with electional where that, I mean, is there something, you know, in terms of that perfect moment and also the constraints of needing to act, you know, like how do you ra- grapple with that? Yeah, with electional astrology, I do adhere to how I was taught by Austin, an Austin Copic. I'm a teacher in the Fundamentals of Astrology program. And when we're talking about selecting an election. It's not for how the baseline of your chart functions. Like if you have a 10th house that is doing all right, and there aren't extreme malefic constant issues, you don't need to use electional astrology. It's an edge that you can accept that you can take on. But when we think of it When are the extremes that we would want to use mitigation for? When would we really want to help and remediate? And this is for things that, if left to our own devices, our path tends to be a little rocky. Usually, it's the same orientation that I have around the harm reduction. So I will be excited and happy if I utilize an election to give me a boost. But unless I'm seeing active paths that seem fraught. I don't let it feel as loaded to me. The electional astrology as a treat, unless medically necessary. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's really healthy to hear that. Yeah, medically necessary, but also the sensitivity of your approach is nice to hear. I think it's lovely to have a kind of awareness of the true limits of our own root chart and also appreciate that there are maybe some strengths that don't need that edge and that we can just understand how certain facets of our charts are actually powerful and we don't need to be uh, like Hulk Hogan. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And the complexity of it is respect because if it isn't, well, the whole, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Sometimes there's so much complexity happening that we don't recognize that what might feel uncomfortable is part of how we do our success. You know, mm. so you don't want to untangle things that are currently working for you. Right. Yeah. And that an electional chart really does stand on its own is an approach that I do take where the tie to the root chart only makes us more likely to engage our own patterns. And if it can be just clean and nice and good for anyone, then that's what we want to tie it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So your third book in this lineup would be? The Celestial Art, which is edited by Austin Kopic and Daniel Schulte. I approach astrology with not necessarily skepticism, but I respect this idea That actually is something my partner, Alex, talks about a fair bit, which I think is like a mix of wine and complex adaptive systems theory. (laughs) But if you have, if you have a model that is sufficiently complex and internally consistent, it will model reality. It will take the shapes of life. Um, it will be consistent with what we actually are experiencing. And we're interested in the different philosophies and the different models, and they don't have to syncretize perfectly, but if they work internally, then that's wonderful. So approaching astrological magic with what is the complex system that this is working with is really fruitful because it's also ways to connect with people because we have a lot of different beliefs. And there's a way to do that when we can recognize the usefulness of many different models. That book has a plethora of approaches under one roof in a way. It's like already itself modeling that collection of alterity. Yeah, it really does. The essay that Austin has in it about the stars is what I would want. And then also Freedom Cole's explanation of the lunar through the Vedic. I have not studied the geotish. So having that reference is a great brain spark. 
It's kind of nice to have unexplored territory because, well, I think astrologies will always give us an unexplored territory. Just when you think you've seen it all, there's a a book that comes out of nowhere and like, well, actually, this is how I measure this space-time continuum. You're going, whoa. Yeah, and so much of it works. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, this adaptive, is you said adaptive systems theory? Complex adaptive systems theory. Yeah. Yeah. So is that something like a dynamic fractal or something like the game Go? Yeah, it is. Very cool. All right. So if someone were going to be asking you, how do I get into astrology? What books would you put in their hands? The one that I mentioned is Carolyn Casey, Visionary Activist Astrology, because it's introducing you to the planets one by one in a really rich relational way. That is a leap out of the Hellenistic. She is very much in the modern astrology. And I just love the way that she talks about the evolution of relationship with each planet. Uh, It gives you the whole arc of how to do it and that it is so unique. We're all exploring these archetypes that are that are really real and really cohesive, but take chapters and chapters just to talk about one. So I think getting to know the planets is the way to start. And then I also, I do still love Demetra George's Astrology for Yourself, which is a workbook format, because it takes the foundational concepts of here's the mode, here's the polarity, we've mapped out this planet, now we're going to put it in a house. It's a good step-by-step to get to know that this is actually a system. It's not just a planet and a sign. So we're making the leap from how we first usually get introduced to astrology to how to work the whole thing. Yeah, and it's very interactive too because of the workbook format. Yeah, it engages a lot of learning styles. Awesome. All right. Well, are there any other ways you have for people to enter this astrological hermeneutic circle? (laughs) Mm, Yeah, I run a membership space is called Consideration Before Judgment. And you can find it through my website, which is amygreensastrology.com. And I host groups consistently. So they'll vary season by season, but they will be there. And it's a lot of interaction. There are always opportunities for private tutoring around things that we're learning in groups so that there isn't a barrier there. So I'm all aboard. We're open and welcome. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much for taking time to share your perspectives and, and insights in these texts. And yeah, I loved it. Oh, I appreciate so much what you're doing out there. It's really part of the important project of what we're doing at the end of this Earth era in the next air. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you meant planet Earth. I'm like, whoa, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. yes, yes. The air continuum and also the Uranus North Node conjunction in Taurus. It still maintains a kind of need for that tactility, you know, and the experiential and that relationship between. And so... Yeah, these groups that you're hosting and and holding space for, I think, are like really important. So we've got both sides of the country covered as of now. (laughs) Yeah, we've got it all figured out. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) there's always something to reckon with. (laughs) I mean, that in the sense of like Reshnin, like German calculating charts considerations yeah, for judgment. That was a very nerdy joke, and I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, and have an awesome day. Thanks so much. You too. Thank you for listening to Within Orb. To learn more about the Celestial Arts Education Library, or to become a member, visit our website at kaylee.institute. That's www.caeli.institute. If you enjoyed this episode, please help spread the word. Follow or subscribe to Within Orb in your podcatcher of choice. Rate it five stars or write us a happy review. This helps others find the show. We also want to give a big thanks to the indie band The E-Block for contributing their song Wake Up for our intro and outro music. You can find them at their website, eblockband.com. This is Jen's Art, signing off for now. See you next time.